This week on Jerusalem Dateline, more than 70 nations gather in Paris to decide the future of Israel. Plus, terror strikes Jerusalem again, this time killing four, wounding many more. And Mike Huckabee addresses the changing of the guard in the U.S. and what it means for Israel and the passing of a very special friend of Zion. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Secretary of State John Kerry, along with dozens of Western and Arab officials, will meet in Paris on January 15th for a controversial conference. They'll look for a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but they're without two very key players. Noticeably absent from the so-called Paris Peace Conference are the main players, Israel and the Palestinians. The only way to reach true coexistence between Israelis and Palestinians is by direct negotiation. Israeli Deputy Foreign Minister Zippy Hotaveli told CBN News there's clear proof direct talks can work without interference from third parties. We reached peace with two of our neighbors, Egypt and Jordan, by direct negotiation. The conference plan appears to be the opposite of that strategy. Organizers want to bring representatives from more than 70 countries to talk about a peace resolution, then invite Israel and the Palestinians. And those conferences are giving the illusion to the Palestinian side that the international community can solve the problems, can give them all what they, they want without speaking to the Israeli side. It's a farce. Um, there is no peace conference in Paris. There's a, a, an attempt to force Israel to give up our own capital of Jerusalem, to surrender our own land to radical Islam. The Israeli newspaper Haaretz reports it's obtained a draft of the final declaration for the conference. The draft welcomes UN Security Council Resolution 2334, which clearly condemns settlement activity, incitement, and violence. It also calls for both sides to restate their commitment to a two-state solution and disavow official voices that reject this solution. One of those voices Israeli Education Minister Naftali Bennett. They don't accept the fact that this has been our land for 4,000 years, as anyone who opens the Bible can actually read, and uh, they want to annihilate this uh, Jewish state. While the world watches Paris and waits for a Trump administration, Israel worries that President Obama might have one card left to play at the UN. The concern is that it might come in another resolution, this one recognizing a Palestinian state without Israel's consent. Some experts say the UN resolution that preceded the Paris Peace Conference gave a tailwind to terror. Jerusalem experienced that when a deadly terror attack killed four Israeli soldiers, including three women cadets and injured 17 others. CBN senior editor John Wagi has that story. Police call it one of the worst terror attacks in Jerusalem in more than a year. We know that he deliberately drove that vehicle, the truck, into the group of soldiers that he saw that had just got off the bus. It was definitely a terrorist attack. It was caused intentionally. And our main emphasis is to make sure there's no further terrorist attacks here in Jerusalem today. One video shows the driver barreling up over the curb and driving through the soldiers, then backing up at high speed in order to run over more people before authorities shot and killed him. It happened as about 200 soldiers participated in a field day. And I was just downstairs with my group, another group of soldiers, and we just heard what's going on, and we, it was very frightening. Everyone just ran away and tried to find a place to hide, and that's exactly what I did. When we arrived on scene, there were a number of victims, both trapped under the, the front of the truck, as well as uh, next to the truck and we began to treat them. The situation, like all terror attacks, no matter how much you prepare, was mayhem. That is what it's like at a terror attack. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman visited the scene. This is part of the same pattern uh, inspired by Islamic uh, State, by ISIS, that we saw in, uh, uh, first in France and then in Germany, now in Jerusalem. This is part of the same ongoing battle against this global scourge of the new terrorism. We can only fight it together, but we have to fight it, and we will. The attacker came from the eastern Jerusalem neighborhood of Jabal Mukaber, home to other terrorists in the past. Palestinians celebrated the attack in Gaza. Hamas declared the attack heroic and said it proved that Palestinians would not stop pursuing jihad. 
Forty Israelis and two Americans have now died in various terrorist attacks and vehicular assaults here since September 2015. Many fear terrorism will only increase following the UN Security Council resolution condemning Israeli settlements in the West Bank. John Wagi, CBN News, Jerusalem. The Paris Peace Conference is not the first time Palestinians have tried to pursue their independent statehood through international means instead of through negotiations. They're claiming the land known as the West Bank. But as we see here, that area carries a history that started long before the world ever heard of Palestinians. Most of the world calls it the West Bank, but the Bible gave it a different name. We find it in the Bible that it's not called the West Bank, although it is on the West Bank of the Jordan. We know it as Judea and Samaria. On the hills of Judea, Samaria, the Jewish people were born, and that's where it all started. That's where Abraham walked. That's where Isaac and Jacob lived. That's where Jacob slept and had his famous dream. Jordan took over the West Bank following the 1948 Israeli-Arab War. About 20 years later, Israel regained control during the 1967 Six-Day War. 1.6 million Palestinians and 350,000 Israeli Jews live here. Now this area, known as Israel's biblical heartland, could be the future Palestinian state. This is Highway 60, the main West Bank thoroughfare for both Israelis and Palestinian Arabs. But Dean Bai says it's much more. It's probably one of the most amazing roads uh, in all of history because God met with his patriarchs. He met with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He covenanted this land there. Along this road, Jesus met with a Samaritan woman. It's along this, this, this road that, uh, that he declared to her who he was. Some biblical highlights along this road are present-day Jewish communities. They include Jerusalem and Shiloh, home of the first Jewish tabernacle. This Israeli park is near Anatot. According to the Bible, this is where God told Jeremiah to buy a piece of land and bury the deed in a clay pot as a sign the Jewish people would return to the land. He says, I want you to buy from your uncle uh, a piece of land in Anathoth, and would you do it up legally with a seal and a deed and a title, and would you put it in a clay pot so it will last a long time? Despite the significance, you won't see many visitors. That's because many West Bank cities are under Palestinian Arab control. In fact, the only controlled areas frequented by tourists are Bethlehem and Jericho, the oldest city in the world. Holy sites under Arab control, unfortunately, time and again are ruined. For example, long-time Israeli-Palestinian agreements protected Joseph's tomb in Nablus as a Jewish holy site. But in 2000, Palestinians forced out the Jewish study center there and ransacked the place. Then, a few months ago, a Palestinian policeman killed a Jewish worshiper there. Israel called it a terror attack. Other sites under dispute include Rachel's tomb in Bethlehem and the cave of the patriarchs in Hebron, where Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their wives are buried. While some Israelis would be willing to swap Judea, Samaria, and this biblical heritage for peace, Naftali Bennett objects. The source of the Bible is here. If, God forbid, we uproot ourselves, there will never be peace. They'll say, man, these Jews don't feel any connection, so how about just wiping them out of this country altogether? If we're not in Jerusalem, if we're not in Hebron, if we're not in Bethel, we won't be in Tel Aviv. Bai says it's up to Christians to take the side of God. I think God's plan and His purposes was that Israel would allow the stranger to dwell here, but he's, in, he's given this inheritance to Israel. He's given this to Israel to be the steward of this land. At least we can do is respect God's choosing. Coming up, former Governor Mike Huckabee says Obama is leaving the White House and the world in a mess. Former Governor Mike Huckabee is a great friend of Israel. I sat down with the governor in Jerusalem recently and asked him about how he thinks relations will be between the incoming Trump administration and the Jewish state. 
Governor Huckabee, thanks for joining us on CBN News. Great to be back. First of all, what is your reaction to the UN Resolution 2334 that the uh, United States abstained? It was uh, embarrassing that the United States abstained. I think it was uh, almost unforgivable that they did not stand with Israel in what was a anti-Semitic act of hate on the part of the UN. And I felt like that uh, John Kerry's rationale for really making mm -hmm. Israel the whipping boy of the United Nations was beneath the principles of the United States. And what consequences do you think that might be for Israel, and especially here in the city of Jerusalem? Well, I think ultimately it's going to be reversed because mm -hmm. I expect that Donald Trump and his administration will make it very clear that if, if this kind of action against one of our allies is going to stand, uh, again, an anti-Semitic act of hate, um, that if necessary, I mean, I'd like to see the president-elect say, we'll pull out of the UN. We provide almost 25% of all the support for the entire organization. Do you see a concern before January 20th at the Obama administration We'll try to go one more time to the UN Security Council. I think we're all concerned that mm -hmm. this is an administration that is like a renter that is getting ready to vacate the apartment. Um, but before he does, he breaks every window, pulls the plumbing out of the walls, and punches holes in the ceiling just to leave it as big a mess as possible for the new tenant who's coming in. That's petulant. And it's also. Um, beneath the dignity of the office of the presidency because presidents historically don't try to make major long-term policy shifts that will encumber future administrations. And how would you describe what you believe would be the relationship between the Trump administration and Israel? There will be a, um, a new level of candor and I think willingness to, to discuss issues honestly and both sides will feel that they're, they're looking after the best interest of their countries and of their ally. What do you think about the, uh, the proposal that uh, the Trump administration will move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem? It's the law of the United States that our embassy would be located in Jerusalem and has been since 1995. But every president has pushed that decision off, always with the thing of, well, it, it might not be received real well. Well, why will we always act according to the pressure of people who would commit terrorist acts? Why don't we act according to what's best, what's right? Uh, do you see a change in, in how they relate to the quote-unquote West Bank, uh, otherwise known as yeah. Judea and Samaria? Uh, yes, I do. I think, for one thing, the Trump administration will call it by its proper name, Judea and Samaria, and stop referring it to the West Bank. I don't think you'll hear the term occupy. Israel has been occupied before, but it was occupied by the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Romans, the, uh, the Turks, the Brits. It's been occupied by a lot of people. But it's owned by the Jews. And the fact that they're living here, well, that's appropriate for between three and 4,000 years. This has been their indigenous, historical, biblical, political homeland. And, you know, for us to try to pretend that somebody else has a claim um, to Yerushalayim is nonsense. Great. Any other thoughts, uh, Governor? You know, I'm very optimistic about uh, the, these next few years. I think it's going to mark a dramatically improved relationship between Israel and the United States, one that's based on trust and mutual interest to, uh, to combat terrorism and uh, evil and to stand for things that really matter mm -hmm. to the foundation of a society. Coming up, a state-of-the-art museum tells the story of Christian Zionist help to the Jewish people and to the Jewish state. Few people may realize that Christians played a major role in the formation of the modern state of Israel. But a state-of-the-art museum in Jerusalem tells this hidden history. The museum greets visitors with a profound introduction, stunning aerials of Israel, while a map traces the land given by God to the 12 tribes, all set to originally scored music. The museum uses state-of-the-art technology. For example, this area is one of the largest touch panel exhibits anywhere in the world. Touch one of these panels and you can find out more information about Christian Zionists throughout history. The modern features like video mapping aim to tell new audiences one of the most compelling and often unknown stories about modern Israel, the role of Christian Zionism. 
Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressed this history in a 2012 speech. I don't believe that the Jewish state and modern Zionism would have been possible without Christian Zionism. I think that uh, the many Christian supporters of the rebirth of the Jewish state and the ingathering of the Jewish people in the 19th century made possible the rise of Jewish Zionism. American Mike Evans built the museum to spread the word of Christian Zionism's place in history. Wanting a home for Christians to celebrate their heroes and their history, I found no place in Israel where Bible-believing Christians can go to, and they have heroes and they have history. The museum is based on years of research and this two-volume set written by Evans. There's so many of them. I mean, if you just take George Bush, 1844, this guy was a Hebrew professor, and he wrote a book that sold a million copies on the restoration of Israel. And yes, his two relatives were U.S. presidents. Others like Ord Wingate formed the first Jewish fighting unit in nearly 2,000 years, the beginning of the Israeli modern army we see today. Women like Corrie ten Boom and her family. The Nazis killed her father and sister, and she suffered in a concentration camp because they hid Jews during the Holocaust. And Swedish diplomat Raoul Wallenberg faced death to save Jews. In the dead of winter, Wallenberg joined the thousands of Jewish prisoners in the death marches to Auschwitz, trying to save anyone he could. What was it that to face death I realized, number one, it was their Bible. They had an intimate relationship with the living Lord, and they loved the Word of God, and they were willing to commit their life for it. And with the Word of God came promises to the Jewish people. Those scriptural promises are woven through the exhibits, from Ezekiel to Isaiah to Abraham. According to the ancient writings, one day, God appeared to Abram and spoke the words that would give birth to the nation of Israel. For visitors, the experience is wow. It's an experience like, like no other. I mean, you go in there and it's, it's interactive. You'll learn a lot of things that you probably never even learned. I thought this was a, one of the most impressive things I've seen in Israel in the time that I've been here. Many never knew the history and now want to tell others. I am going to tell everyone that I can think of, people in my synagogue, to come here to see how this beautiful land of Israel was not built just by the Jews, but by the Christians and the wonderful people who risked their lives to make us a homeland. For Evans, the museum lets the Jewish people know that although enemies surround Israel, they're not alone. They see Auschwitz, and what they went through, and they see the alienation in the world today, and they come through it, and they say, we're not alone. Coming up, a tribute to one of the modern friends of Zion and a dear friend. We want to honor one of those friends of Zion and our dear friend, Gary Beyer. He lost his nearly three-year battle with cancer recently, but throughout his life, he touched thousands of lives with his humor, grace, and love. Gary was a dear personal friend, a friend to our whole bureau, and an advocate for this show. We'll leave you this week with a look back at his life and the many people he touched. Gary Byer served as an actor, director, and producer. His acting career spanned decades, and you may have seen him in television shows, movies, or documentaries with people like Mickey Rooney, Pat Boone, or Michael W. Smith. He had a knack for comedy. Oh, you're on live? Yeah, no, we both are, honey. <laughs> both were, were the shows, you know, being broadcast. So. I'm on camera. Later in life, he came to Israel and fell in love with his wife, Cindy. Their love for each other and the land of Israel inspired them to begin Writers Gathering. He explained why in an interview for Jerusalem Dateline at their house called The Place of Stories. We bring writers over here. We look for writers that are mainstream writers. <clears throat> you see their movies, you see their, their shows on television, you read their books, but they've never been here. And if you looked at the body of their work, it's what I would call life-affirming, and they're really good at their craft, but they've never been here. We bring them here in hopes that it will encourage them to tell stories about this place that are life-affirming. At a Jerusalem memorial, his family and friends remembered how he touched so many. 
a man who loved God, loved his wife, loved his family, loved his children, loved his friends. The kindness to people, his humbleness, his love for story. He's a great storyteller. He was a great, great storyteller. So. But we worked together on numerous occasions, and I was just so impressed by his professionalism and by the man that he was. He could inspire. How can we pray for you? That was one of his main phrases. How can we pray for you? And even when, with all the illness and the, the pain, it was always, well, how can I pray for you? Gary was a cool Christian. Gary had a profound impact on people, including his oncologist, Dr. Cherney. He crossed the line of being a patient to being a friend and is welcomed as such. His friendship extended not only to, my, to, my, to me, but to an extraordinary breadth of my family. Gary's final resting place is on Mount Zion. It's fitting since Jerusalem was so much a part of his life. But many know it's not the end for Gary, it's just the beginning. But just as Melek David said about his child that he lost, he said, I can't bring him back to me, but I can go one day where he is. And praise God, we can go one day to where Gary is. Now it can be said of Gary, as Paul wrote, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. We are standing in his presence on hold. Remember, throughout the week, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.